about complex root canal anatomy, uh, what's really down there. Um, we always, whenever we're doing endodontics, we always want to um, really determine, you know, or have a good sense of what the anatomy is inside uh, the teeth that we're going to work on before we begin any treatment. Um, it's good to have a good knowledge of canal anatomy, um, have an idea of what the incidences of different canals are and the systems in, in different teeth. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, canal anatomy and just give you an idea of what can potentially be down there in some of these teeth. So the question is, why is understanding root canal anatomy so important? And uh, you got to have some knowledge of anatomy, and it helps us determine axis design and canal location. If we don't look for, for it, we're not going to find it. You know, it's in there, but we have to look for it. And sometimes we always make an assumption, okay, well, this tooth only has three canals, and we don't really spend the time looking for any additional canals. And and there may be a fourth canal in a molar, so. But, you know, you never know unless you look for it. Unnecessary tooth removal can compromise the, re the final restoration. So we always have to be concerned about um, looking for canals and we want to remove some, some tooth structure to try to find some canals, uh, but we also have to be mindful of removing um, too much tooth structure because you don't want to compromise the final restoration. And then also having a good understanding of root canal anatomy helps us avoid any perforations or um, any procedural errors or broken files uh, because you have an idea of what the anatomy is going to be like. So when we're thinking about teeth, um, we have the, the pulp complex. And let me see if I can just kind of move this over. The pulp complex has a beginning and an end. Uh, the beginning has pulp horns and the end has apical foramina. Okay, and, and the pulp complex is, a, is, is a, it consists of systems. You know, it's just not straight lines that go down into these roots. It's, it's actually systems. Um, our goal uh, concerning the pulp complex is uh, number one, the location of the canals, finding the canals, removing the pulp tissue, and then, of course, uh, preserving tooth structure. So there, there are stages of uh, cleaning and shaping that pulp complex, and that was discussed by Krasner and Rankall. Uh, that was JOE 2004, and he broke it down, and, and they broke it down and said there's a pre-axis analysis, there's removal of the pulp chamber roof, uh, you want to be able to identify um, certain landmarks in the pulpal floor and in the canals. And then, of course, once you have that, then you can begin instrumentation of those canals. All right, so pre-axis analysis consists of a couple of laws. Uh, you want to identify the CEJ, and once you do that, there's, there's the law of centrality, and there's also the law of concentricity. Uh, the law of centrality just basically says look, that the pulp chamber of, of every tooth is at the center of the tooth, right at the level of the CEJ. So when you get to the CEJ, that pulp chamber is gonna be right in the middle. Um, the law of concentricity basically states that the walls of the pulp chamber are concentric to the external outline of the tooth at the level of the CEJ. But what does this mean? Well, if you look at this illustration, you've got the law of centrality, and they have a, uh, a cross section that's cut of, of a mandibular molar, and it shows that the amount of dentin to, in relation to the pulp chamber is equidistant, and that pulp chamber is directly in the center uh, on all, you know, all sides of that tooth. Um, and then when you look at the other one with the law of concentricity, um, you have once again a mandibular molar, it's, it's cut right at the level of the CEJ, and you see that the, um, the pulp chamber walls uh, in relation to the outer external surface of the tooth are, are actually... Right. 
So we've got a pre-access analysis. And with the pre-access analysis, we want to determine the angulation of the tooth. And, and we can do that by getting different angled x-rays. Uh, you know, there's a study by, by a guy named Brian Off, and uh, they took different angled x-rays, and they said the more angled x-rays that you take of a tooth, the more information you get, and the better your diagnosis becomes. Uh, and then, of course, nowadays we've got CBCTs where we can actually see a tooth in three dimensions and really get an idea of the angulation of the tooth. Uh, we also want to measure the distance from the cusp tip to the pulpal floor to give us an idea of how long uh, we've got to go before we access into the uh, pulpal floor because we want to avoid perforation. And then uh, initial occlusal point of penetration. So we're looking for pulp horns or what's, the, what's going to be the initial uh, occlusal point of penetration. When we're unroofing the pulp chamber, uh, we want to go ahead and make sure we can get all of that pulp chamber removed. And, and we don't want to go directly apically. We just want to make sure we can get to the coronal aspect of that pulp chamber and then just move laterally to avoid the pulpal floor. So how do we know that our access is complete? We know our access is complete once we know we've removed all of the roof of that pulp chamber. Uh, and then we could see, you know, the different, different changes in color on the pulpal floor. The law of color change, that's when you see the color of the pulpal floor is always a little darker than the surrounding walls. And then you also should be able to identify, identify the wall, the floor wall junction. So if you actually if you go back to this uh, picture of these lower molars that have been sectioned, you could see different color changes and you could also see developmental grooves uh, on the pulpal floor. That, that give you clues that, you know, you're definitely into the pulp chamber. So it's definitely color changes that you see there that help you appreciate those changes. Once, you've, once you get into the pulp, pulp chamber, you wanna go ahead and uh, locate the orifice of the canals. Um, and you wanna use different landmarks to help you identify those, those canal orifices. Um, there's, there's something called the laws of floor anatomy and there's, there's, there's two of them, uh, the law of symmetry and the law of orifice location. Um, there's a law of symmetry one and two and law of orifice location one and two. The laws of symmetry state that canals are equidistant from a central line to the mesial, to the distal on the pulpal floor. And that's, that's the law of symmetry one. And the law of symmetry two states that orifices of canals lie on a line perpendicular to the mesial distal line. Uh, and this, this law doesn't apply to maxillary molars. Maxillary molars is a little different. So when we're looking at mandibular molars, there's a law of symmetry. And what that means, if you draw an imaginary line from the mesial to the distal, that line is gonna bisect those canal orifices and it should be equidistant on either side if it's not equidistant, then you know there might be another canal. And I'll show you, show you what that means in a minute. The law of orifice location one and two shows that orifices are located at the wall floor junction. That's number one. Number two states that orifices are located at the vertices of the uh, wall junction. So when you look at the illustration, you'll see wherever there's a vertice where two lines come together, uh, usually at that point, there should be a canal. And this, this is a maxillary molar. This is a maxillary molar. And you can see this in a maxillary molar. So when we're looking at those laws of floor anatomy, if you look at the first illustration, um, you'll see a, a premolar, maxillary premolar. We're looking down into the pulp chamber of that maxillary premolar. And when we look into that premolar, we see um, if we're using the laws of symmetry, we see that um, that buccal canal is a little off-centered. It's more towards the, uh, the distal. And 
And when we look at the, uh, the vertices, we know that there should be something else at that vertice on the mesial aspect of that premolar. So we know there's got to be another, another canal that's in there. So we could always look for that. Uh, the other illustrations are a mandibular molar, and those, those are pretty lined up pretty, pretty evenly. And if you look at the, uh, the mesial and distal grooves of that molar, those canals are pretty, pretty equidistant, um, right, uh, centered right down the middle of that imaginary line from mesial to distal. Keep in mind that the number and position of orifices can't always be known prior to treatment. You know, sometimes you just don't know. Even with radiographs and CBCTs, you look in there, um, you know, you, you think you got it all, but, but sometimes there's more than what you see when you get inside these teeth. So you have to actually look for them, just like we mentioned before. So I always like to ask the question, what is really down there? Because we go into these teeth and, and we think we know what's down there. And we think it's safe to go in some of these teeth. And, and sometimes we're just not really sure what's in there. So root canal systems are complex. You have uh, a lot of multiple foramina, webs, fins, loops, apical deltas. And then, of course, you've got uh, lateral canals or accessory canals. So you got your systems that you're working with. And uh, they were studied by a lot of people. You had Hess, Okamura, Kasahara, Fatucci, uh, Wine, and then Pineda and Cutler. And, and we'll talk about some of the studies that some of these people had, uh, had done and some of the findings and, and what we go by today in endodontics. Brown and Heverson uh, did a 3D tooth atlas and, and they found a lot of information on, on teeth and, and and when they did this 3D tooth atlas, they were able to do the actual tooth, um, an illustration of the tooth, and then of course, something that looks like a CBCT 3D image of the tooth. And you could rotate it in three dimensions and really see the uh, complex anatomy <laughs> by these teeth. So Wines classification uh, breaks down teeth uh, based on uh, the anatomy of these teeth is type one, which is one canal with one orifice and has one apex, one apical foramen. Type two has two canal orifices and has one apical foramen. Type three has two apical foramen and two canals at the orifice. And type four has one canal orifice and it bifurcates mid-root and splits up into two canals with two separate apices. But anomalies do exist. And we know that in endodontics, just when you think you've got it all figured out, uh, you go into a tooth and you see something that's totally off the wall. And we see quite a few of those in endodontics. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is you still got to look for it. You won't find it until you search. And that's so important in endodontics. I mean, with all the technology that we have, uh, with CBCTs and, uh, you know, different x-rays and a lot of technology we have, we still have to look for these canals. And we got to use microscopes and, and, and a lot of aids to help us find canals. So... Let's talk a little bit about tooth anatomy and we can discuss, um, you know, what the incidences are in, in a lot of the teeth that, that we, we work in. Um, some of this, you've, you've, most of this you've done already, but we're just going to go through it and then we can talk about some of the anomalies that we might see in some of these teeth. So maxillary centrals, uh, laterals and canines, Almost 100% of them have one canal. Um, it's very rare to see two canals in any of these teeth, uh, but sometimes you do see them, but it's really, really rare. So in maxillary centrals and canines, the apex tends to displace uh, distolabally, and in maxillary laterals, the apex tends to displace distolingually. <laughs> And 
because they have a distal lingual dilaceration towards the lingual, if there's a lesion uh, or, or an abscess or granuloma on, on these teeth, um, that lesion's not gonna come out on the buccal. Uh, it's more likely to spread out some bone towards the palate and may even have a palatal lesion. Or, or if it's large enough, it can perforate the buccal. Um, but, but it's, it can be a little bit more destructive than, than um, a maxillary central or a maxillary canine, which more often than not, that lesion just automatically just comes out on the buccal because it's right there. The tip of that apex is right there. So when we look at a CBCT of a uh, maxillary lateral, we can see there's some displacement uh, and there's a lesion between teeth number six and seven. Um, and a lot of that is from that, that tooth where the distal dilaceration and the palatal dilaceration on that lateral incisor just forces that lesion towards the palate. There you can see perforation between six and seven where you have pretty much almost a through and through lesion. All right, and same thing on his tooth. So the solution for us, a tooth like this is root canal treatment. You go ahead and treat the endo and that lesion should heal. Sometimes we do have to do apical surgery and we do biopsy that tissue and um, we get that area to heal. Uh, also, if we need to do bone grafting, we can do some bone grafting. Now mandibular anteriors are a little different. Uh, Vitucci did a study in 1989, and it was a really extensive study on, on teeth and anatomy and teeth. And what he found is that mandibular anterior teeth almost always have, a lot of them have multiple canals. I'm not going to say almost always, but 70% uh, of mandibular centrals have just one canal. But then you got 25% that have two canals, or really with, with the single foramen, 5% uh, of them uh, have a separate apical foramen. Mandibular laterals, even, even less, have one canal. Only 55% of lateral incisors on the, on, the, on the lower teeth have one canal. Um, you got 45% that have two canals. Of those, 15% of them have two separate foramen. And mandibular canines, same thing. You got 30% that have two canals and 10% of them have separate foramen. So, you know, just what I was saying before, you know, you, you really don't know what's down there unless you look for them. Um, CBCTs can help, you know, you could see what's, what's down there a little bit. It's just more information where you can see a little bit more of what's down there with CBCTs. But once again, you know, um, is it indicated to take a CBCT if you got a patient who needs a root canal on a, on a mandibular canine? Not every case unless there's some other circumstance, maybe resorption or if it's a retreatment. Um, but, but initial root canal treatment, we think it's pretty routine uh, until you get in there. And if you're not looking for these additional canals, um, you're not gonna find them if you're not looking for them. So when you look, when you do root canals on these lower anteriors, always take a little extra time to see if you could find an extra canal. And more often than not, that extra canal is going to be more towards the lingual. So just take a little bit of time looking for those. Here's an example of a mandibular canine. And this, this root canal was done on this, this lower canine. Treatment was done uh, years prior. And the patient had a lesion. Uh, and the tooth was not healing. Um, the root canal filling is short of the apex. So... Normally you think, okay, well, we just need to get down to the apex and treat this, retreat this tooth and we should be able to get this to heal. But it's not until you start working in there, uh, you find out, okay, well, hey, here's my working length. But then I look at the x-ray, I say, okay, maybe there's something else in there. Let me just take another look. And we use our microscope and we take another look and there is another canal and it is on the lingual the lingual aspect of, of this of this tooth. So the buckle was always treated, and that's the one that we got in there and filled. But we went back 
and we found another canal and the second canal was on the lingual. So we went back and treated it. It's a separate, separate canal with a separate apex, um, separate root on a, on a mandibular canine. And that's where we filled it. Okay, and that's our final x-ray, that, that lower canine. So now that should heal. Uh, crown should be re replaced. And, um, you know, it's good to find out why a tooth failed when you're retreating it. It gives you a better sense of, okay, you know, the prognosis on this is, is favorable. It's just an angled x-ray of it. So, and then once again, that's a lower canine. Sometimes you just don't know what's in there. Okay, maxillary premolars. Okay, maxillary premolars, according to Vertucci, um, the first premolar, only 8% of first premolars have one canal. So if you do a maxillary first premolar and you just treat one canal, chances are you're not done yet. Uh, you gotta get back in there and find that other canal. Um, I can't remember the last time I treated a maxillary first molar with one canal. Very, very, almost never. It's very rare. Uh, but they say it's 8%. Um, you know, 87% have two canals. So almost 90% of them have two canals, you know. Um, and then you do find 5% that have three canals. So it's not unusual to find three canals on a, uh, a maxillary premolar. Okay, so now maxillary second premolars is a little different. You do have 75% that have just one canal. So that's different from the first premolars. Of those, 24% have two canals and then 1% have three canals. So you do have some anatomy on some of these upper premolars with um, multiple canals and you'll have some dilacerations on them, some curves. So we go on and retreat some of these and then you find out that there are three canals. Let's see, some questions. Let's take a look. I'm gonna go back. Hang on, there's some questions, it looks like. Let's see. You guys have any questions? Oh, okay, the question is, uh, okay, we can uh, get some copies of, of this when we're done. Copies of the slide, that's not a problem. All right. All right, so mandibular premolars, Mandibular premolars, a little tricky. A mandibular premolar can either be the easiest tooth in the mouth to treat or the most difficult tooth in the mouth to treat. And, and the reason is when they have more than one canal, a lot of times they, they bifurcate, they split. And I hate when they do that because those are really, really difficult to treat. Um, so first premolars, 70% of them have one canal. Uh, however, you know, about 30% of them, they, they bifurcate. You know, you've got 25 that have two, and I think it's more, they say half percent have three canals. I think it's higher than half percent. Um, second premolars, 97% have one canal. I think, I think it's, it's less than that. I think, you know, you get a higher percentage that have two canals and lower premolars. Um, this study was done in 1978, it's an older study. Um, but this is what they, were, they found. And they said it's rare to have three canals in mandibular premolars. And we find them. Let's see. So a lot of times you have what's called a fast break in these lower premolars when you look at the x-ray. 
slowly talked about fast breaks and uh, basically presented different ways to identify extra canals on a radiograph. And you see a space and you see the canal on the x-ray. And then all of a sudden, as you go down, you're following the canal, you're tracing it. And as you go down, it looks like it starts to calcify. Well, that's a wine type four canal configuration where it, where it bifurcates. So that's called a fast break. And here's a good example. Uh, you've got a tooth and as you follow that canal on that premolar, um, the canal goes down into the premolar and then all of a sudden it looks like it starts to calcify, but it's not really calcifying. It's just a fast break that's there. So you know there's a bifurcation low down into the apical third of that root. Those are really tough to treat. It starts off as one canal, and then it bifurcates in the apical third. And that's a wine type four. And that's a one-year recall of that case. Thank goodness they got rid of that cantilever bridge, right? Here's a mandibular premolar retreatment. And once again, there's one canal that was found in this um, premolar. This is a mandibular first premolar. And there was another canal in there. Uh, two canals, two separate apices. Another mandibular first premolar. We looked in here and we did a down pack and we see that there's actually a third canal in the apical third where it trifurcates. This is, this is a, a nightmare to treat because it's hard to get in there. I can't do this without a microscope because it's so hard to see where they bifurcate. But, 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 but by going in there and looking for it with a microscope, that really helps tremendously. Um, and we're able to get in there and, and, and treat these. Some of them have uh, lateral canals and you see a, a high incidence of apical deltas and lateral canals in the apical third of lower premolars. Um, when you go back, you look at this lesion, there's a lesion uh, in the apex of that tooth, periapical lesion, and the lesion is not only at the apex of the tooth, but it's all, also a lesion on the mesial aspect and the distal aspect of that tooth. And when you treat it, you see there's a lateral canal that goes right into the area where that lesion is. And mandibular first premolars, once again, a lot of them, you know, they say the incidence of them having... Um, Three canals is, is, is relatively low, but we find that it's a little bit higher. We find quite a few of them. This one has two roots, separate roots, and then one of the roots has two canals. So it's uh, three orifices, and all those apices are separate. And here's a different angle of the same tooth where you can see separate apices on this tooth. Okay, uh, two roots, once again. Um, Yeah, so these two roots, and you'll see that there are uh, two canals in one of the roots, and the other root, the second root, has just one canal. All right, so that's it for today. I'm going to continue the next time with part two, and we're going to finish up with part two the next time. I, would, I do want to take some questions, if anybody has any questions, if Dr. Dr. Hayes wants to uh, send over some questions. Let me see if we're able to get those. Yeah. Hang on, let me back that up. Let me see if, I, if we can do the voice. Um, let's see. This way. Yeah, in the show. Okay, Dr. Taylor, can you hear me? Dr. Taylor, can you hear me? Go back to Zoom. Here we go. Dr. Shaw, what's your what's your question? Let's see. Let's see how we can do this. For those of you that are 
have to go. We actually extended the time so your site supervisors know that you guys are running late. So if you want to stay another 10 minutes, you can. Dr. Taylor, can you hear me? Yes, we do have some questions. Can you hear me? Can't hear. Can't hear. <laughs> what about now? Can you hear me now? No, I don't hear. Okay, that's a good question. So her question is, hang on. It's a good question. Her question is, if we find, if we are doing a retreatment and, and it, hang on, hold on, I got a little feedback. If we're doing a retreatment and there's a canal that's filled and it looks good, do you retreat the canal that's filled that looks good or just treat the one that has the lesion? Um, and, and the answer to that, it, it really depends. Um, and what we do, we use judgment based on when the root canal was done. And if we believe that there's coronal microleakage and bacterial contamination in that canal system, if we believe there's microbial contamination in there, then we treat all the canals. But let's say you have a case where the root canal was done a couple months ago. Uh, general dentist did a root canal patient comes into us, they're still having pain, you know, we may go back in and look for another canal or take a CBCT to see if there's another canal. If we find another canal, we'll just treat the one that was missed because all the other canals were just done and they're clean. So we'll just treat the one that was missed. But if this root canal was done like five years ago or more, and we know this bacteria that's down in there, then we'll treat all the canals. We'll make sure we treat all the canals. That's a good question. Another question. Another question. Another question. Now you end up, you end up, you end up now. Another question. Another question. Was it helpful? Was it helpful? Yeah. Yeah. So, Dr. Taylor, uh, no other questions for this morning. Okay, great. Good. Sure. Hopefully we'll be able to share uh, the slides and anything else. And then we'll get you set up for your part two, because I'm sure you have some more anatomy. Yeah. So part two. Part two is going to be molars. We're going to go over molars. And there's a lot more complexities in molars, maxillary and mandibular molars. So we're gonna spend a little more time just talking and discussing uh, molars. All right? All right, sounds good. All right. Thanks. Thanks. All right, thanks again. All right, have a great day, everybody. All right.